Well, let's, let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Saint Joseph, all you holy married men and women, pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's go, everybody. Married people, raise your hands. Oh, dang, there's a lot of y'all. Catholics just start early, I guess. Single people, raise your hands. <laughs> the guys are like, oh, Kurt. <laughs> I know many of you are here to learn not only about the vocation of marriage, but you're here to find your future, boo. <laughs> Some of y'all literally thought that seek meant seeking for your Catholic spouse. You're like, no, for real, why, why, why is that funny? You're like the true story I heard once of a lady. She was told to pray in Ovidian to St. Anthony to find her future spouse. Nine days ended. Another 18, another 27. This novena lasted two years, okay? Because St. Anthony's supposed to find you lost things. <laughs> two years, she's pissed. She's so mad. She took her little statue of St. Anthony. She's like, ah! Chucked it out the window. Mad woman, right? The statue hits a guy. Future husband. True story, I am not suggesting you break your statues, people. Crazy though, right? It's funny, it's funny. I see some of y'all, I just walked into the chapel, the, the Adoration Chapel. If y'all haven't been, please, that's the treasure of this conference, amen? It's Jesus in the Eucharist. But you know, I, I'm, I'm just kind of like seeing everyone praying. I'm like, oh, what good students, you know? And I see some of you guys trying to, you know, get close to that girl and whisper sweet nothings through her veil, like, um, Hey, my guardian angel thinks you're cute. <laughs> it's cringy, but I get it. I get it. I can't hate on the hustle and the holy desperation that some of you have in wanting to discern marriage. It's a good and holy desire. But here I stand. Here I stand on the other side of the excitement and angst of, of singleness and dating. I'm old enough now to be your uncle, many of you. It's true. I'm, I'm literally turning 40 in March. It's true. It's true. Asian don't raise him. That's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've been happily married to my beautiful bride, Maggie. It's going to be 10 years this August. Very thankful for her. She's a champ. Thank you so much, my beautiful wife. Have five kids. My fifth kid on the way. I drive a minivan. It's a pretty solid ride. <laughs> I have a mortgage, a life insurance policy, we're all gonna die. Thank you. But for real, um, in the words of Nacho Libre, let's get down to the nitty gritty. People are often told that marriage is worth waiting for, is beautiful, and that it requires a lot of work. Anyone heard that before? It's all true. Many Catholic young adults are often taken by surprise, however, at the realities of marriage, that maybe their marriage prep didn't quite prep them for, or maybe they were just like so googly-eyed at each other. I can't wait to marry you. <laughs> that maybe they didn't really consider all of the things waiting for him. Now, the point of my talk here today is not to scare anyone. It's just to give you a really healthy understanding of some of the things that I've learned over the past 10 years of being married. Things that I believe that if you put it into practice can be real game changers for your life. Because here's the thing, falling in love is easy. Super easy. I mean, tender easy, like easy. But staying in love, that's a master class. That is an absolute master class. So no one gets married hoping that one day it will fail and end in divorce, nobody. I mean, even the people who get married in Vegas, I don't know why they do this, but even they, I don't think anyone gets married with the intention of like, yeah, I just want this to go down, burn in flames, and yeah, just be a sad memory. No one. So what I am presenting today, what I'm suggesting is let's do everything in our power 
with the help of God's grace, of course, to do everything to bulletproof our current marriage or our future marriage. Amen? Let's go. Point number one. Marriage does not solve your problems in life. Many people who are single raise their hand, and, and granted, there's a joy and an excitement at possibly meeting someone, but, but let me just break it down in really clear terms. You, have you all met someone, one of some of your single friends, and they're just a little bit too eager, and they're like, oh my gosh, when I meet that special someone, I'm getting emotional already. It's going to be so amazing. All my problems will go away. No, they won't. I'm, so, I'm sorry, honey. They're, they're not going away. Marriage brings up all of your issues and your problems and your sins and your family's sins. It all comes up in glorious fashion. And it's a very sobering thing. Because here's the reality. We have two very different people who are coming together trying to make it work. Two people with very unique and distinct personalities, with different struggles, with different hang-ups, with different hurts and traumas in their life, with different family backgrounds. And so imagine what happens when they try to become one. They're already going to have disagreements. There's already going to be conflicts because, you know, the toilet paper, it, it shouldn't be the mullet. I don't know why you people do this. It should be the waterfall. But you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have an argument over the toilet paper. I've literally had that argument before with my wife. And it's never really about the toilet paper. I'll get to that later. So marriage forces you in a beautiful way to deal with the problems, to purify you, okay? But here, to my friends who are still single, this is from my heart, deal with the stuff now, okay? Every one of us in this room, including myself here at this podium, have issues. We have sins, we have things that we're working out. Let's face it, we live in a broken world, we struggle with sin, we have hangups, and we have things that happen, right? That makes you human. But the great challenge of adulthood especially is maturing and not being afraid to face these problems head on and say, you know what, I'm not gonna defer it like my college loans. Sorry, I know it's a little bit too soon. Um, I'm not gonna defer on this. I'm gonna deal with it now. Don't ignore the flags in your life, amen? It's not weakness to acknowledge that you have problems or issues. It's weakness to know that it's there and you do nothing about it. That's weakness, and I'll tell you why. If you don't deal with it now, someone else is gonna deal with it later. Your future spouse, your future kids, your future family, your future community, your future work people. I mean, I'm not kidding you. This stuff is real, but do not be afraid. St. Peter, legendary, honest prayer. Lord, depart from me, bro. I'm a hot mess. And Jesus looks at Peter, sees more in Peter than he can see in himself. He says, do not be afraid. I'll make you a fisher of men. That's the good news. With Christ, we can do all things. But do not defer on working it out. Talk to a pastor. Talk to a counselor. Call up a therapist. Heck, you could just do it online from the comfort of your home. I've gone to therapy. It's wonderful. It helps. There's a website called catholictherapist.com, I believe. If it's not .com, it's .org. It's a great resource. You can find a, a trained therapist who's a Catholic who will keep those values in mind as they help you to achieve your goals. Don't be afraid to do that. Listen, if you get unhealthy, where do you go? To the doctor. If you throw out your back, where do you go? To a chiropractor. If you have deep-rooted emotional issues, where do you go? Amazon. <laughs> what? To the club. <laughs> what problems? Don't defer, because it's not going away until you decide by the grace of God to work on it, amen? Next point, the number one cause of divorce in America is bad breath, no, um, financial problems. What? I don't even work right now, bro. <laughs> it's okay, you're gonna be fine. Financial problems, one of the top causes of divorce in America. What the heck? Okay, now I'm not gonna even begin to get into the topic of how I feel you guys are being overcharged for college education. Even though there's a value, there's a great value in it, it, it it's one of the biggest expenses in your life. And unfortunately for many of you, there's debt waiting for you as soon as you graduate. So one, it behooves you to remember that every time you miss class or a lecture, you just wasted hundreds of dollars. Yo, 
You gotta pay it back with interest. Mm. Brothers and sisters, it's time to have a game plan. Government ain't paying it for you. I'm sorry, they're not. And if they do, you're gonna get taxed on the other side through what? Inflation, okay? Either way you cut it, the buck stops at us. Brothers and sisters, personal finance can seem like a really daunting thing, but it's already waiting for you at the end of your college career. So start with a game plan. I remember being married. I didn't know a thing about personal finance. I looked at my bank account and I got pissed. I'm like, dude, all that money in there, I owe to the loan thing. <laughs> I'm like, that's messed up. As if I like, someone forced me to go to college. I, I chose to go to college. So I went to Barnes and Nobles. I went to the personal finance section. I'm like, all right, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. <laughs> I found this bald guy with glasses, his name's Dave Ramsey. Okay. <laughs> he had a book called Total Money Makeover. I'm like, oh, he looks, he looks rich, okay, come on. I didn't even buy the book. I sat down in the coffee area and I read it for free. First good financial decision. <laughs> I didn't buy no latte. I got the tap water with ice cubes, what? <laughs> and for the next two hours, I consumed this book like a feral beast, right? I, 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 just, I was like, yes, I know personal finance now. And what was so great about that read in very simple to understand terms, he teaches baby steps to help people get out of debt, budget how much they're spending, how much they're saving, and what they should invest in. I highly recommend that you get this in check, even if you're not graduated yet. Why? Because like I said, you're going to have to pay it. Okay? So if you can hustle now, heck, I know it's going to cramp on some of your weekend plans, but heck, if you can get a job now, if you can start a side hustle, if you can start focusing... If you can line up those career opportunities right now by talking to people who are crushing it in the field that you're studying for and make sure that you have a game plan as soon as you get that diploma and you're out, good for you. And why does all this effort matter? Because according to that statistic, if the number one cause of divorce in America is financial problems, you could literally save your future marriage by caring about this today. It's sobering, but it's true. Do not defer. Next point, chastity is not just for single folks, consecrated religious, it's for married people too. Okay, just give you a very practical example. The church teaches in response to society's widely accepted use of contraception, natural family planning. My acronym for NFP is no freaking problem, okay? You didn't get that, it's okay. I'll explain a little bit more. <laughs> NFP is a wonderful gift that God has given the church. There are many different forms of it. Creighton Method, Symptothermal, Marquette, the list goes on and on. But when I got married, I had to like learn things about how a woman's body works that I, I just frankly didn't have to care about all my life. And I'm like, you have to go through this? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, God bless y'all ladies. God bless y'all ladies. You go through a lot. Amen, amen. Yeah, you, you, let's, go, let's clap, amen. I mean, the lines for the bathrooms, I'm sorry. I don't, God knew I didn't have that level of patience. He made me a man. But NFP, one of the beauties of it, if it's used correctly, if it's used correctly, it's even more effective than contraception. People who use NFP have a less than 5% divorce rate. Why? Because it's 100% natural. It causes both husband and wife to have a conversation regularly about are we ready to welcome a child into the world? And if for a serious reason the couple is not ready to welcome a child into the world, guess what? The church says, okay, then abstain during the fertile week of the month for the girl. All right, so most of y'all, y'all been abstaining for a while because you ain't married. But when you're married and then you have to abstain, it's like, what? I waited and I have to wait again? But the beauty of it is this, why? It causes husband and wife to have to wait to practice chastity yet again. And what is chastity ultimately? It's controlling your sexual desire. It's realizing that even in a marriage, sex isn't the end all be all. 
It's just literally the icing of the cake. What is the cake? It's learning how to love. And what is love? Willing the good of the other. There's going to be times where either spouse doesn't feel like it. Wife is pregnant and uncomfortable. It's just not feasibly possible for whatever reason. And guess what? They have to wait. Chastity is not just for single people. And just because you're married doesn't mean you don't find other people attractive. I'm sorry to break it to y'all, but you know the struggles you have as a single person to like have pure thoughts and make sure you're like focused on God and, and, and rebuking temptation. It still continues. Why? Because if you have a brain, then you recognize beauty. That's not the problem. If I as a man see another beautiful woman, I'm like, praise God. Why? Because he created that beautiful woman for some other lucky guy. I don't have to be afraid of beauty, but the temptation is to lust and to grasp, right? That's what the devil is always scheming to do. He's trying to get us to grasp, to counterfeit the thing which God created, the opportunity, whatever. So I see a beautiful person, I see a beautiful woman. The temptation might be, well, maybe you should DM her. Maybe you should look at some more of her pictures. Maybe you should kind of go on her profiles and stuff. And really, at the end of the day, that is what it is. It's a temptation. Now, what I can do is I can immediately bring Christ into those temptations and say, God, I'm being tempted, so I offer that to you. Obviously, I love my wife. I'm committed to her, and I don't want to do that. Give me the grace to stay faithful and true to you and to my wife. And as for her, she's very attracted. You, you did a fantastic job. You did wonderful, God. You're great. But you gave me a gorgeous wife, and I thank you for her. Game on, okay? Creating healthy boundaries for yourself is key. For example, even when you're married, it's good to communicate with your spouse about if and when it's appropriate to hang out alone with a friend of the opposite sex. It might be a friend from college. It might be a fellow focus missionary. It might be so-and-so from where and where. And, but the fact is, when you're married, your primary vocation, your focus is your wife. So what was once appropriate as a single person isn't always appropriate as a married person. Things change. That vow, that promise has to be respected. And so naturally, if one spouse has a problem with, hey, why are you going to have dinner with this person? Oh, I don't, who is this person? I, I mean, I know you were friends, but I don't feel comfortable with that. Allowing yourself to friend an ex on Facebook, Instagram, nah, why? Oh, I want to bring the gospel to her. Oh, slow down there. Slow down there, St. Paul. Okay. <laughs> okay. Boundaries, healthy boundaries, wise boundaries, right? Um, and I'll, I'll speak as a guy, but it goes the same way for girls. Like, if, if I'm scrolling mindlessly through, through Instagram and I'm spending a little bit too much time looking at this girl's profile, I have to check myself and say, why am I doing I need... Mm, yeah, let's, let's, get, let's get back on track here. Let's focus. Um, avoiding situations, avoiding situations online and in person that could allow the enemy to step in there and start capitalizing on a situation I could have avoided. That's important. So all of these things, really important to keep in mind. Now, if you leave with anything from this talk, please focus and seek to, li see what I did there, <laughs> to listen to this next segment, okay? You got your money's worth if you literally write this down and you focus on what I'm about to say. Every couple argues and fights. Every single couple. But not every couple learns how to become masters of conflict management, okay? I'm gonna set you up with some tools. That th these are literally ways to bulletproof your future marriage. Most people fall into one of two extremes. Either one, they blow up, they blow up when they get angry or hurt, or they get passive aggressive. Amen? Anyone ever seen this in yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's easy to go into one extreme or the other. I, I feel misunderstood, I feel hurt, I'm gonna blow up at you, or I'm just gonna pretend you don't exist anymore. Neither are healthy, neither are the way. Conflict delayed is conflict multiplied. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, but it's awkward. I mean, I know I want to say something, but I don't want to, like, make it awkward. It's already awkward, bro. 
don't be afraid to address the elephant in the room because if you don't, it just, the mold grows and it's gonna poison the relationship. Even if you're single, start now with your dorm mate, with your friend who said that thing that hurt you. Don't be afraid to deal with the conflict, okay? My wife and I, I swear, like, this happens all the time, but it's good. Because, you know, for example, my wife, uh, she was, uh, what was she? Okay, I'm trying to, there are many things, so I have to literally. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh, this is embarrassing. I'm trying to think of an exact. Okay, for instance, um, I was talking to my wife. She gets upset. And she's washing the dishes, and I'm trying to, like, connect with her, but she's not talking to me. So I'm like, is something all right, babe? She's like, it's fine, which means it's not fine in woman talk, right? <laughs> and so when, eventually I'm able to extrapolate what indeed is wrong. And, and she expressed to me that she felt underappreciated because maybe I didn't thank her or uh, it was something like, it sounds trivial, but to her it was not. Like I, I wasn't helping scrape off the food and it got stuck and it made it harder for her. And so you know, point taken, but it's funny how like that had to then translate to us talking about the thing and going down to the deeper meaning of why she was hurt. Okay, this is gonna happen a million times in your marriage and it's okay, do not be afraid of it. The gentle startup, write this down. I feel blank when you blank and I would like you to fill in the blank. Why is this so flipping helpful? I will tell you why. Because imagine if she was like, oh, you want to know why I'm mad? Because you don't scrape the things, you little jerk. You know, okay. Then World War III begins, okay. Or if she got passive aggressive. It's like, no, clearly there's conflict and nothing's being said. But the gentle startup. Hey, honey, can I, can I talk to you about something? Okay, great. Preparing myself. Honey, I felt a little hurt and looked over. Fill in the blank. When you didn't scrape the stuff off the dish. Blank. And I would like you to please help me by scraping them off in the future. Yeah, sure, honey. I'm, I'm sorry that you felt hurt. Of course I'll help you. You're my woman. <laughs> See how easy that was? Now, there are obviously going to be more complex things that fill in those blanks, depending on what the situation is. But describing very honestly the way you feel, the negative emotion, right? That is completely just honest. It's not a character judgment at them, blah, blah, blah. I felt this, okay? You have every right to feel what you feel. When you did this, just explain it in clear terms, not like when you didn't scrape the dish like your dad, you know, like, no, 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 no. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't, why'd you do that? <laughs> that was dumb. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't add that part. When you did the blank, and I would like you, and give the clear thing that you're asking for. And when you do that, the gentle startup, it helps the couples to one, have time to like process and think without feeling attacked. One of the foremost marriage experts in the world, his name is Dr. John Gottman. And he, per, he predicted with almost 90% accuracy, like just based on one session with couples, who would divorce and who would stay married. And one of the things he came to understand was that there's something called the four deadly horsemen in marriage. They are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. The four deadly horsemen of the apocalypse wreak havoc on the world. The four deadly horsemen of marriage also wreak havoc. Criticism, we all know what that is. You always do this, you're such a piece of work. Defensiveness, I never do that. In fact, you do that. Right? Stonewalling. Oh, no, no. Stonewalling. Contempt. I, I don't even respect you. You're foul. 
right? Contempt. That's the most dangerous one, but they're all dangerous in their own way. Why? Because whenever the horsemen creep into the conversation, it's not going somewhere good fast. So be aware of the horsemen that you subscribe to. When the horseman shows up in the conflict, in the conversation or the argument, use a script. I feel like criticism, like I felt very criticized by that comment. Could you please stop doing that? Could you please communicate that differently? Okay, have a deal with each other that you will fight as a couple against the four deadly horsemen. Oh yeah, sorry. Sorry, let me figure out a better way to explain what I'm feeling right now, okay? There are gonna be times when one or two of you get emotionally flooded, what does that mean? You ever feel so emotional that it becomes really hard to rationally communicate now? You start saying and doing things that you regret, anyone? Thank you for your honesty, it's gonna happen. It's going to happen in marriage, okay? Now, if in the context of an argument or a discussion, one or both of you start getting too emotionally heightened, you know, colorful words start coming out, this sort of thing, that's usually a flag. <sighs> Honey, I feel like too emotionally flooded right now. Can we take a break? But this is the important part, say a time. Can we come back to this conversation in 15 minutes? I just, I need to take a breather. Because here's why. One, you're saving both of y'all from saying or doing things that you're gonna regret. And two, by saying that I need this much time to come back, you're respecting the other person and not walking away from them, right? Because when you're trying to floss something out and they're not like giving you the attention and they walk away, oh, heck no, right? So honey, I feel, too, I just feel too emotional right now. Can we take a break? Come back to this conversation, please. Very, very important. And so brothers and sisters, listen, when people get flooded emotionally, when, when a conversation is going south very, very quickly, sometimes really scary thoughts come through people's heads. And I wanna be totally honest about this, okay? Sometimes when the conflict is the most severe, there are scary thoughts that come into our heads like this is not going to work out. Maybe I married the wrong person. This is obviously going to end in divorce. It's a very vulnerable feeling, and it's very real. When that thought comes through your head, rebuke it immediately in the name of Jesus Christ, who sealed the deal with you and your spouse when you said, I do at the altar, because that's all it is. It's a temptation. It's a fleeting thought. Rebuke it and move forward. Because the, the amazing thing about marriage is it's one of the most beautiful gifts. If you are called to marriage and you have Christ at the center and you have discerned wisely this person to, to, to entrust your heart to, marriage can be one of the most beautiful gifts that you ever experienced in this life. But it will also be one of the greatest challenges you also face in your life. There are gonna be moments where you feel like you're married to your best friend and other fleeting moments where you feel like you're married to your worst enemy. But I said fleeting for a reason. Why? Because we're all human. Because we all have good days and bad days because there are gonna be moments where our emotions are just running too high and we're getting sucker punched by the enemy and by ourselves. But I promise you, it is worth it. It is good, because what is the end game of marriage? What is the end game of any vocation, brothers and sisters? It's heaven, it's, it's to help you look like Christ. And how did he look? That's how he looked. He laid his life down so that others could live. That's not just for our priests. Ooh, vocations video, no, no, no. That's for married people too, amen? Marriage is supposed to help you look more like Jesus Christ. And I promise you, man, the, the exercises are there to help you to become just that. That is the game plan. That is the end game of every Catholic Christian marriage. And it's good. It's worth it. And what's so crazy is when marriage, 
when marriage ends in this life, because it does end the moment one of the spouses dies, it is a sign that points us to what? Eternal life, right? When you were driving here to St. Louis, you may have been on the highway, you saw a sign that said, St. Louis, 30 miles. When you get to St. Louis, do you need the sign anymore? No, because you're there. That's like marriage. Marriage is the sacrament that points to what? The ultimate marriage, our marriage with God, the marriage feast of the Lamb, which we're all invited to, by the way. Seek is really cool. It's awesome to be here with you guys, to have amazing conversations and experiences, to be with the Lord in the Eucharist and at Mass. But it has nothing on eternal life. Amen? Guys, life is so incredibly short. Sometimes I multiply my age by two, and I go, oh, shoot, that's 80. I'm almost gone. <laughs> no offense if there's any 80-year-olds, sir. I'm sorry. I love you. It's, it's cool. You're closer to heaven than I am. It's all, what, I don't know. The po- Stop digging a grave, Paul. Okay. <laughs> Pray for me. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you something. These 10 years have zipped by. Holy smokes. I, unfortunately, I don't have like, any more time to, to talk about what I was planning on talking about. But I will tell you this. It's all worth it. My gosh. God is so good. And, and I'm not just saying that in a cliche filler type of way. He is good. He has a plan for your life. If you're called to marriage, please consider the things that I shared with you today. I promise you it will come in handy. So the soft startup, being aware of the four horsemen, And then investing at least 15 minutes every day in connecting with each other and showing why you appreciate them, speaking it. And even when you have kids, invest in a babysitter. I see some of y'all with kids. You're like, but we can't afford it. You can't afford not to take a date night because that's literally your vocation first. Y'all love each other. Y'all are connected. The kids are going to feel and experience that. And it's all worth it. To the degree that you prepare your hearts now, my single brothers and sisters, is the degree you prepare yourself for your future vocation, especially the gift of marriage. 